Welcome back to the Evolution of Horror. My name is Mike Munzer. As ever, I am your host. If you're tuning in for the first time, then welcome. Usually on this podcast, we explore and dissect the history and the evolution of the horror genre by looking at particular subgenres one season at a time. We are currently in the middle of our hiatus. Just before Christmas, we finished our season on vampire movies, and we'll be back in a couple of months' time to begin our next season on home invasion horror. But in the meantime, we're bringing you a little little bonus episode this week to celebrate the release of weird, creepy British folk horror Ennis Main. This is directed by the brilliant Mark Jenkin, who made the acclaimed movie Bait in 2019, and is really carving a little niche for himself as the master of kind of Cornish folk horror. Uh, Ennis Main is a very strange, atmospheric movie at, that really feels reminiscent of the kind of 70s British folk horrors. You know, it reminded me of everything from Pender's Fen to the owl service to a warning to the curious so this really ticked all my boxes i absolutely loved it i got to sit down and chat to the director mark jenkin um, about making the film and about his relationship with the horror genre and specifically 70s british folk horror uh, so just to warn you what you're about to hear is pretty much spoiler free i mean ennis main is a very difficult film to spoil it's really about the experience of watching it so we're not going to spoil anything that will ruin the experience for you but please do go and check out Ennis Main when it's out in UK cinemas on the 13th of January also Mark Jenkin has programmed a whole season of films with the BFI that kind of link to Ennis Main as well and there are some really interesting lesser known horror films uh, that are being played as part of that season that will be in the BFI in London but also in certain regional cinemas and I will link the details to that in the show notes so please enjoy my discussion with the director of Bait and Ennis Main, Mark Jenkin. Hello, Mark Jenkin. Hello. Hello. It's so lovely to have you here. So first of all, Mark, set us up. I mean, it's a difficult thing to describe this film plot wise because I feel like it's more of an experience, right? But what can you tell people about Ennis Main? Um, well, I, I can sort of talk about it now because it's been screened. There's been enough previews and, yeah. and festival screenings that the audience have told me what they sort of think it's about. Mm -hmm. but, mm -hmm. but actually, I won't go into that. I'll just the, the setup is that it's a it's a film that's set in 1973 on a remote island off the coast of Cornwall and it follows a winter into spring following a woman called the volunteer who is mm. on the island observing a, a small group of very rare flowers for a wildlife trust mm -hmm. and um, uh, and yeah she's there on her own and the only thing she's really got for company is a standing stone that looks down on the, the cottage that she lives in. Uh, and I've been calling it Ennis Men, but I've been told it's Ennis Main. Is that right? Yeah, pronounced M A N E. Okay, all right. So it's it means Ennis Main in it. It's Cornish for Stone Island, right? And Main is the, a contraction of the word Menia, which means standing stone or long stone. Love it. So tell me, where did the idea for this film come from? What's the origin? We had two origins really. It was firstly, was being haunted by standing stones yeah as a, as a kid and two two standing stones specifically near my grand's house that sort of haunted me as a child <laughs> and so i think that that had already that that's always been in my mind the idea of the of the of of people who've been turned to stone which was the kind of christian myths that we were told um whereas you know the the truth is um pre-Christian and yeah and a, and a lot more interesting but maybe less scary mm -hmm. so I was kind of interested in standing stones in in that way and then aside from that when I when when bait was being reviewed and it was in front of audiences quite a lot of the time people were writing about bait saying it felt like at times it was tipping over into horror it felt like yeah. horror um, or it felt like it had the potential to to go in a, a on a horrific path so I think when I was kind of conceiving what was going to come next after bait, yeah, I I just had horror in my head, and I thought, you know, I'd always I'm a, I'm a horror fan. Um, for me, you know, in a lot of ways, cinema is horror, and but I think I'd always been wary of making a horror film because I'm also 
quite quite scared of the horror audience. Right, and the reaction really? a horror audience might might um might give a film. But then I realised, but I am the horror audience, and yeah. actually, it's such a um it's such a broad church. The yeah. horror, well, the horror genre is so huge, like as proved by your podcast which goes on and on and on <laughs> keep fine and then, you know i see the next sub genre i think oh yeah that's horror isn't it and you know it's like where it doesn't end which is brilliant so i sort of gave in or i didn't give in i, I thought actually um, it would be really fun to try and make a horror film yeah and so i wrote ennis main very very quickly which which i've said several times at, at q and a's i've said that i wrote um, the script for Ennis Main in, in three nights and nobody is ever surprised by that fact. <laughs> but, um, and, and, I, and I wrote it and then I read it back and I thought I haven't, this isn't a horror film. You know, mm. th there's not a lot of horror on the page. There isn't a huge amount on the page at all really. And then it made me realise that, that for me, I think the horror is in the form yeah. Horrors in the film. I like the idea of a kind of haunted film or an untrustworthy film where it's formally unnerving and there's there's the weird and the eerie within the form rather than necessarily all in the content. Mm. And then I thought, ah, that's why people have been pointing out that bait felt like a horror. It's not got horror content, it's the form. So it's another example of audiences and critics telling me what it was that I'd done. I which, love that. Which happens a lot. Yeah. It's so true, though. I felt the same way. And I, I mean, I, I, I am known for calling everything horror. But for me, Bait did feel a bit like a horror movie. And I think it is because of that form. Like you said, it's got that kind of weird uncanny about it. It's got a, almost a kind of sense of dread. And maybe it's because of your choice of how you chose to film it and the sound design and that kind of thing. There is something almost a little bit otherworldly about your films, which I love. Yeah, I think I think this dislocated sound and picture. Yeah is eerie i also think flash forwards mm. go into the realm of horror because mm -hmm. they're very different to flashbacks there's quite a lot of flash forwards within within bait and i think that's quite unnerving if you if you flash back you're just sort of reminding mm. the audience of what they've seen you know and you can change the context of it but but the audience are always quite comfortable in the fact like, oh, oh, I've seen that. It may have just been recontextualized or it might be a reminder of something that's happened. But when you flash forward, I think the reaction in the audience is, oh, hold on, what am I, what's yeah. that? What, what, I've missed something. Why am I seeing that? Such a good point. Yeah. And I think that's, and for me, when I try and think about, you know, people always say to me, oh, what's your favorite horror film or what's your favorite genre of horror or subgenre? I find it very difficult to sort of, to kind of identify where my interest in horror is, it, apart from the fact that I, I love films that where the t linear time becomes untrustworthy, because that's the scary thing for me, is when time doesn't make sense. And it's, you know, I think um, having been through, I, th I always go like so many of my sort of the context for this film and what I talk about goes back to sort of what happened, what's happened in the last couple of years with COVID. Yeah, but I remember going to, to, to bed the first night when they finally announced the lockdown, you know, finally told told us what we needed to do. Yeah. And I remember going to bed with a sort of sense of relief that a decision seemed to have been made, yeah. but also a sense of, well, this is weird. This is gonna, this is really odd now. We're effectively stuck in our houses, we're gonna go to bed, mm. gonna wake up in the morning and we're gonna be just in the house. Yeah. But the thing that was really hopeful about it was that fact of, you wake up in the morning and it's another day you know that saying of tomorrow's another day yeah. and it's like actually this will get better every we'll go to bed and we'll get up in the morning it'll be another day and gradually it'll get better it might get worse first but mm. eventually it'll get better the real horror is if you go to bed one night and it doesn't get light in the morning you know right. the sun doesn't come up that morning which made me it makes me think of you know like the the third Blair Witch film that yeah. I think's called the Blair Witch. Just the Blair with the Adam yeah. Wingard 2016, whatever it was. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Which got really sort of slated. Yeah. But there's the, there's a bit in that film that I think is utterly terrifying mm. is when they're sort of running around inside the house. In is the it when they're sort of stuck in a loop? Yeah, like, and they yeah. just sort of realise that it hasn't got light. Yeah. 
and that that captures that for me that idea of like you can rationalize everything but if time stops making sense mm. it's very difficult to rationalize that that's yeah and, and that's really interesting that there, there is something of that in ennis main like the you know the pacing of it tell me a little bit about the kind of the, the pacing this story out because there is that kind of repetitive nature right of of this character of the volunteer kind of waking up every morning going through those motions over and over again um almost there is something of a kind of lockdown life to what that this, this character goes through yeah right? which was really weird because we we made, we made the film just at the end of the second lockdown. So right. I mean, most people were still in lockdown, but because we were working, we were allowed to make the film. Mm -hmm. I mean, we weren't allowed to meet up beforehand and we weren't allowed to have a rap party or anything like that. It was kind of pretty much still in lockdown. Right, yeah. And we were putting on screen this version of a life that people had been living and, uh, for, for ages and people were saying, oh, it must have been really must have been really sort of strange making a film that was about lockdown, yeah. about isolation, whilst, you know, just within that yeah. still within that world but it, it wasn't like that at all because behind the camera was a was the crew who were a bunch of people who'd been isolated for each from each other right. for ages so we were having like a whale of a time just yeah. meeting up with people and stuff and then if suddenly when the camera was rolling it was like right back to this sort of isolation and repetition and everything but that yeah within the film i mean that's <clears throat> i i always knew that i wanted a, a quite a simple routine for the character to have mm. that then could be subverted and pulled apart and turned on its head yeah and eventually sort of reclaimed as a as a routine that was the kind of spine of the film and to be honest some of that comes from when you're working with limited resources and limited budget mm -hmm. that that becomes a, a sort of limitation that i embrace yeah so you know like for example the scenes where she drops the the stone down the mine shaft you know we just shot at that location for a day and just you know the shot list was just the same shot over and over again with slight variations it was really sort of mechanical yeah and in fact we used a, an arm and a hand double for mary for loads of that because we just didn't want her out there yeah sort of just endlessly doing this sort of very mechanical <laughs> stuff sorry blow apart the, the magic of yeah. the movies there but so sometimes it, you know i mean i think all of my filmmaking comes the starting point is what what have we got what can we do yeah rather than oh i've got a big idea how are we gonna realize it which doesn't mean that the films don't mean anything and haven't got like a thematic um resonance m with me or anything but i but i you know i like that got our quote about show me the budget and i'll show you the movie you know it's there's no point falling there's no point being over ambitious and falling short through a lack of resources and 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 time and money or whatever it is so i i knew that the routine would be central mm. to to the film and then i think it just it, while we were shooting it i think we did realize that you know that was it was something that we'd all although the film was conceived and written before I'd even heard of coronavirus. Right. I do think, you know, we sort of just through pure chance, kind of as we were shooting, thought this is a little bit like what we've all been living through and the importance of routine, you yes. know. Suddenly that, like with my family, that, that hour that we used to go and run up and down the field out the back of our house, yeah. you know, we did it at the same time every day and it was something to really cling on to. Yeah. And I do think if somebody had said, like the farmer who let us use that field, if one day he'd said, oh, you can't use the field today mm -hmm. after going out there for a month doing it every single day, I think we would have been thrown into a total existential spin. Yeah, yeah. So I, I do think all that all that was in there without it being consciously in the script and certainly not something I kind of overthought until people kind of ask me about the routine tell me a little bit about the sort of the technical side of of um the the film and decisions you made with that because obviously bait you know famously it was shot on 16 millimeter am i yeah. right thinking yeah and you kind of recorded all the sound and dialogue afterwards right in post and it, what what kind of decisions did you make with this particular movie and how you shot it well it's exactly the same so it's exactly the same camera yeah it's um the same process so it's a, it's a clockwork bolex h16 sb mm -hmm. for the 16 millimeter film nerds out there <laughs> of which I count myself one um, and yeah all shot silently all post synced yeah so all the dialogue post synced although in this one that was much less of a much less of an undertaking than with bait because there's yeah. not a huge amount of dialogue in this film all sound designed you know all the all the sound done afterwards so all the atmos is all the foley done later on mm -hmm. the the bi the two big differences i suppose was it was color this time yeah so color color neg rather than black and white neg <clears throat> which uh i didn't hand process this time i lab 
processed it, or it was lab processed. And then the other difference was bait was shot on, on a single lens, just on a on a single twenty five millimeter prime lens. Yeah. Whereas with this, because it was set in nineteen seventy three, I thought that gives me permission to get out an old zoom lens and just yeah. go a bit crazy with it, which people have have questioned the number <laughs> of zooms in it. But once the zoom was on the no, on the I camera, love it. I think, yeah, he just use it so that was that was the the big difference and, and i use lots of different lenses so i used a, a zoom we also used a, like a set of five or six primes as well so whereas with with bait i knew that the the neg was going to look really inconsistent because the way i was processing it, it was going to be yeah. all over the place we kind of decided that we'd need one thing that was consistent and that yeah. was just the, the focal length of the lens yeah because i would because this one's lab processed i wanted it to get a bit of sort of craziness in there that yeah. would be missing from the lab because the lab process it so beautifully yeah so i wanted to sort of get 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 in there and interfere with the aesthetic a little bit so that was by using all sorts of different lenses and i i just wanted to kind of put myself in mind of somebody who was making a low budget horror film in the 1970s and mm. what they would have done was used everything they could get their hands on yeah. so i limited what we could get our hands on but then once we decided on that list like it was like right we can use all of this stuff you know it's just whatever whatever we think works for a particular scene let's just do it i love it and you're right you know it goes back to the, what you were saying at the beginning about using the form to tell the story really because it, it it's not just a film that feels like it's set in the 70s it, it feels like it was made in the 70s um and i just wondered you know like as a huge fan myself of kind of british sort of 70s folk horror and that kind of thing what were there any kind of particular inspirations for you in in when you were creating this any reference points I think just very, very stark and very simple visuals, really. So mm. there's no subtlety yeah. in it. The visuals aren't subtle. You know, the close-ups are proper close-ups. The yeah. wide shots are proper wide shots. The zooms are crash zooms. Yeah. And then the same with the soundtrack. There's no nothing subtle on the soundtrack. It's mm. either deafeningly loud or almost, almost silent. Mm. So I think that sort of very simple paired back story visual and sonic storytelling i think goes to like that sort of era of you know like the ghost stories for christmas yeah the lawrence gordon clark stuff where they clearly didn't have enough resources didn't have enough time didn't have enough money and actually all of those things were the 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 the, the, the best conditions that they could have really yeah because yeah. because I think, you know, I, can't, I, I like M.R. James and I've read M.R. James and it's very, and it really is very different to watching those films. And for me, The Ghost Stories of Christmas is about Lawrence Gordon Clark. Because I, I think, he's, I think yeah. he's a genius. I think, you know, he came from that, he came from a documentary mm. background where you have to tell a story, you know, how can I tell a story in seven shots? Actually, we've only got time, we've only, you know, things are moving on we've got to get the story in four shots yeah you know? and there's such an austerity to to the way he shoots stuff which i really love and i think the um the sort of um public information films as well yes a lot of those it's just they're so unsubtle <laughs> so yeah and, and there's a brutality not just in the content yeah. you know something um you know like apaches or something like that oh my god it's, it's it, you know it's not just the content is brutal it's the form is Agreed. so so brutal yeah so that's that's my kind of i think i think they're my big and i, and I think you know I, i'm i'm a bit older than you but i think that there's certain generations in this country who are just scarred <laughs> by yeah. what we were exposed to as kids yeah you know like things like being shown threads at oh my school. god you know. At school, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I <laughs> things like that. I think is just. I mean, I think it leads sometimes leads me to sort of catastrophize because I'll look at something <laughs> the most innocuous thing and go, oh, and all I see is a flash forward to like absolute carnage, yeah, which is yeah. what those films are about. But I think in terms of my filmmaking, I, I'm so glad I was exposed to all that stuff because I'm sort of, I you know, we we were talking. I was talking to produ my producer recently. We were talking about the budget, the yeah. prospective budget for the new film, and he gave me this figure, and I was just like, "What are we going to spend that on?" You know, if that's <laughs> too much. It is. And he said, "Oh, don't worry. I've just got the actors anyway." I was like, "Oh, fine. As long as they don't have to, yeah. you know, move you get away one, from one big name in the film, and that's yeah. it, basically, yeah. isn't it?" As long yeah. as I don't have to move away from massive 
clanking close ups <laughs> and crash zooms and in, like embrace some sort of visual sophistication into my work because there's more money. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, I was going to say, like, do you do you see yourself staying kind of within that area? You know, these really interesting kind of Cornish folk horror, I guess, in a way you've kind of you're kind of creating a kind of sub sub genre. It feels like, and if given the chance, if somebody says come and direct a Marvel movie, would you do it? Do you think? Um, well, I was asked this the other day actually for a magazine article, and which what, my answer was actually published. I was just said I would at the moment we we really need a new roof on our house <laughs> so i probably would say yes <laughs> but i would be that director who was whose name wasn't anywhere on the final <laughs> film there'd be suddenly re- replaced by jj abrams yeah, at yeah. some point there'd be a really <laughs> awkward meeting with the execs just yeah. after lunch on the first day of the shoot <laughs> and then i wouldn't be seen again but no I, I don't know i mean i've been offered a lot of different things yeah, and I bet. you know the temptation is that I take them, but mm-hmm. I know, I know where my strengths are. I know what I can do, mm. and by I think by knowing what you can do, you also know what you can't do. Yeah, and and also what you don't want to do. You know? Yeah, yeah. There's a certain amount of control that I don't want to give up, and I've got you know I'm across all the departments of my filmmaking. Really, yeah. You know, I work with a group of real important collaborators who I couldn't make films without. Mm. But I do have a lot of input across a lot of departments and that keeps me engaged with the whole filmmaking process. I I fell in love with making films on Super 8 when I did everything myself. That's awesome. And that, you know, that was, I I used to be so excited by that. Mm. And And I still am excited by that because I do, I've kept that sort of, that way of working alive in my work so yeah i'm making a film at the moment a short documentary or it's kind partly fiction partly non-fiction film so the last two days i've been in my studio and i've been in between doing press for the film mm. i've been just hand processing black and white 16 mil 16 mil neg and looking at archive stuff on the 16 mil projector wow. in my studio and and i kind of pinched myself that that's my job that i'm getting paid to do that because i was doing that when i was 15 years old and absolutely yeah. loving it so i wouldn't want to make a film where i wasn't excited yeah you know so yeah. i think and you always know in your gut whether a deci- whatever you're deciding your gut always tells you what's right and what's wrong before your heart and your head gets involved so i haven't had anything that's come along that's made me go yeah i really want to do that it's been too much like oh well if i did this to it and i did that to it then i might want to do it but then to make a film's really difficult. Mm. It's it needs a hundred percent of your focus and your energy, and your excitement, mm-hmm. and that will wane during the process anyway. Yeah. But in order to get to the end, you need to start on a hundred percent. If you're already not quite feeling it, you're ne- uh, well. I personally, I wouldn't get to the end, and I sort of be- I'm I become disruptive and <laughs> disinterested and you know I've worked on other people's stuff before and I'm just like you know I go in with all good intentions and then I just go oh, no no you're doing it wrong yeah, you're doing it wrong. you should be doing it like this you know because I just yeah. you know I want to have that sort of authorship over it and I imagine it's you know it's such a huge amount of your time and life when you make a film right you kind of have to love it or else you're going to end up hating it <laughs> and, and yourself I think you know that's what I always think you know, yeah that's what I always say when I get asked quite a lot when I'm doing talks at you sort of to students and stuff it's yeah. like what, you know what advice would you give to student filmmakers and I just always say just tr- spend your education just trying to work out what it is you want to do yeah. and identifying where your excitement is because that's the thing that will carry you through you know and you've got to you've got to go to bed that's why I always say you've got to go to bed on Sunday night excited about getting up on Monday morning you know yeah that's that's the dream I think perfect way to put it you should I mean I would like you to do a ghost story for Christmas for the BBC, right? That would be <laughs> that would be brilliant. And I feel like they are starting to sort of slowly make a bit of a comeback at the moment, which is amazing. Yeah, it, it's funny, isn't it? Because uh, you know, and it might be nostalgia, or you mm-hmm. know, I might be romanticising the form or fetishising, you know, the way films are made. But I always find like the more in, the most interesting horror for me is the stuff that engages with the form as much as the content. Yeah, and I think there is that problem where you have like a homogenised visual aesthetic. That's applied to absolutely everything, and and that will date more than 
yes. anything. Yes. You know, if you're trying to be really current and up to date, that, that will date more than anything, you know. So I do, I'm kind of excited, I, I, I'm kind of excited about this stuff being, you know, the idea of doing a ghost fo- story for Christmas would be amazing. I mean, somebody said to me, oh, what? somebody got in contact and said, you should, you should remake The Owl Service. Somebody just said, the owl service is my favorite thing from my childhood. You'd be perfect to remake it. And I'd be the worst person to remake it because I would just <laughs> do it the do same. It exactly the same. <laughs> I was going to say, remind you, Ennis Men had a, had a vibe of the owl service, Children of the Stone, like that kind of stuff as yeah. well. Yeah. Yeah. So I think I can, I, can, I can revive or keep that aesthetic going and that thing that you know, people might recognize and go, oh, this reminds me of something that I saw in the 1970s or whatever. Or whatever, but I wouldn't, you know, combining it. That that's got to be combined with original content, as it just becomes sort of like Im- impersonating something. So if I was going to do a ghost story for Christmas, what I'd uh, what I'd be more interested in doing would be to take a contemporary story mm. and shoot it in my way. I mean, like yeah. one of my favourite ghost stories for Christmas is the is Stigma. Yes, you know, one that a lot of people don't like. Yeah, and I know Lawrence Gordon Clark doesn't particularly like it from mm. what from what he said, but I think that contemporary setting was even more weird although now it looks pretty dated you know yeah but again there is something about that right that makes it even weirder to watch yeah. and that is gets quite dark and violent and nasty yeah. that one as well, well. We, i i've programmed that that at the bfi for in the season oh i um, love this so um, yeah tell us about this because you are so you're programming a, a whole season for like to screen is it just in in london or is it kind of across the uk it's, no know? it's going to be a few like three or four of them are going to be shown at other venues i love like, this uh, uh, uh i I won't say which ones because I'll probably get it wrong. But yeah, yeah, some yeah. of the regional arts, and I'll, I'll link yeah. to the to the website for people to check out in the show notes. But but yeah, tell us a little bit about that and making those decisions in what you programmed. Well, I mean, it was um, it was Julie at the at the BFI who had distributed in Spain in the UK. She yeah. said, "How would you how would you feel about curating a a season of films yeah. through January to support the release of Venice Main, which mm. is like you know a dream incredible to curate something like that." Yeah. So. Um, and she she suggested the title the the DNA, the cinematic DNA of Venice Main, which yeah. was kind of perfect. So I went through and picked um, what maybe I think it's twelve films and twelve supporting short films. Nice. And and it was I mean it's quite a quite a specific brief, but also I opened it out because I didn't want to just go to sort I didn't want to just kind of concentrate on content yeah. and stuff that had because there's obvious things mm-hmm. I went but I wanted to go to to sort of filmmakers that had inspired the way I work who mm. aren't working in horror and you couldn't link them in any way to to to, to Ennis Main unless you unless I gave it some context so it's like I've, I've programmed um, Agnes Varda's Daguerreotypes right which, yeah yeah know, yeah a documentary about the street she lived on but it's for me, that's the most beautifully edited film I've ever seen. I think yeah. so. That, that's in there, um, and then there's some. There's, there is symptoms. The ghost story of Christmas, which yeah, is in there, nice. which was really interesting because um, I watched that back. I hadn't seen it for a couple of years. I hadn't. Se- I don't think I'd seen it since we made Ennis Main, mm-hmm. and I watched it back because I was having to write the copy for the for the program notes, and I thought, oh, I've borrowed a few <laughs> things from this yeah, yeah. for Ennis Main. So I in the I sort of up, upgraded my notes from sort of saying it was uh, influenced by to saying there were some quite direct <laughs> homages. <laughs> and there's another there's a children's film foundation film that I program called um, Haunters of the Deep. Right. Yeah. Which was shot down on the same in the same mines that we filmed in. Oh, amazing. Certainly some visual homages in there as well, which so I mean that's a film that I probably saw in the in the eighties when it came out. It's one of the later Children's Film Foundation films. Mm. And that obviously had a massive impact on me. Yeah. You know, and it really scared me and and informed me. But I, do you remember this the series that was on the BBC called The Living and the Dead? I know the name, I've done Colin I've ever Morgan seen it. and Charlotte Spencer. Right. But there's one episode that's got the same plot as the Children's Film Foundation Haunters of the Deep. So right. I'm putting that, it's sort of like episode three from the first series of Living and Dead with a, a double bill with Haunters of the Deep from the Children's Film Foundation. Amazing. Which is like, you know, they gave me so much freedom to do whatever I wanted. I sort of sent this through and said, you know, is that all right to do with like an episode of a TV program, a double bill with a kid's film? And they're like, just do whatever you want. That's and amazing. So it was just, yeah, so it's really exciting. And then I, and the big thing was that because people have been talking about the routine of Ennis Main so much, yeah, 
And two first lit reviews from Cannes both mentioned uh, Jean Dillman. Right, yeah. Chantal Ackerman oh, film. Oh, that's as, funny. Yeah, yeah. As, a, as a possible influence. And so I hadn't seen that since I was studying. Yeah. And, um, and so I, yeah, I got hold of, I couldn't get hold of it anywhere because yeah. you can't see it, you know, you can, can't get no, hold of no, it anywhere. No. So, um, I've got a feeling that's going to change now. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> Julie got me, a, Julie at BFI got me a copy of the Criterion yeah. um, DVD, the, the American one. And I sat down and watched it. I thought, actually, I can see why people are saying this is an influence, mm. you know, that routine and the subversion of the routine, all that kind of stuff. So I put it in the, the DNA season thinking, what a brilliant thing, what a gift I'm giving to the <laughs> cinema going public. This little Finally, they'll be gem. able to see this film <laughs> on the big screen for one one time only. And then, what do you know, sight and sound pole, which is now the greatest <laughs> film of all time. I just look like a right band, uh, bandwagon yeah, jumper. Basic choice, you know. That's so good. That's so, no, but that's great. I mean, there are still so many people that have not seen that, you know, you know, which is, which is awesome. A great chance to see it on the big screen as well. That's really cool. How exciting that you get to choose all of these disparate things and, and and you know that kind of rem- makes me think of you know folk horror in general you know I, 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 um, I even did a talk actually at the BFI linked to your film during the LFF about folk horror and this kind of almost impossible subgenre to define really and it feels like w- the world or at least a lot of people have kind of really kind of fallen in love with it in like the last decade or so but yeah. I just wondered like what what is folk horror to you in, in your mind like how would you kind of define folk horror if you could well I've gone on a real journey with my relationship with folk horror mm. and and as a consequence a real relation a real um, journey in terms of the relationship with my identity which right. has all come through folk horror yeah that I was really reluctant to call it a folk horror yeah because I was think I always think of folk horror as in terms of the unholy trinity, yeah. which are, which for me is very a cert, very specific type of Englishness. Yeah. Even though the Wicker Man's set in Scotland, it's still yeah. very much an English yeah. film. And I was quite keen to reject the Englishness of folk horror because I didn't want to sort of allude to pastoral, merry old England, all of this kind of stuff. Because coming being Cornish is very different yeah. we've got a very different history and i didn't want to sort of have this film thought of as a, an english right folk horror with a culture that never existed in cornwall so i spent quite a lot of time rejecting the term mm. folk horror and then i watched that documentary that i can't I never remember the title w- of. W- woodlands dark and days bewitched yeah yes and yes. i watched that a friend of mine gave it to me um and i watched that and went Oh, folk horror is massive. It's everything. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty much yeah. everything, and it's and it's in every country. Yeah. And it's, I think it was the rev- it was like watching the clip of Onibaba and going, "Oh yeah, it's a folk horror. Of course, it's a folk horror." Yeah. And and um, as so I thought, well, we can it can just be a Cornish folk horror. I don't have to allude to. I don't have to reject something. Yeah. I don't have to re- go. Oh, I'm, I'm distancing myself from folk horror because I want this to be Cornish rather than it being English in terms of, you know, culture and history. And at the same time, Denzel, the producer, said, well, the Cornish, you know, we tried to define a Cornish folk horror. and said, well, the Cornish folk horror is like one level deeper than an English folk horror. Mm. So what the English folk horror is picking away at the pastoral, gentle surface to find the sort of, the, the kind of pagan or whatever yeah, underneath. the evil's underneath, yeah. Whereas in Cornwall, the pagan is already on the surface anyway. It's nothing to pick away from. That's everywhere. Yeah. So we're picking the surface below that and ending up going sort of deep underground. So we kind of started thinking, yeah, this is this is a Cornish folk horror, you know? Mm. And, and sometimes, you know, it's all tied up with a, my identity as a, as a Cornish person and a Cornish filmmaker in a relationship you know, where we sit within the British Isles and all that kind of stuff, which sounds like a really massive thing to be talking about. But, you know, we we talk about it, it always gets brought up. You know, it's always Cornish filmmaker, it's always Cornish film. You know, we've got, we've put the the poster out in Cornish, which ended up being in The Guardian and being on the main BBC news website and all of this kind of stuff. So it it is there. And what I, what has been my personal discovery during this process is that, the importance of celebrating what you are rather than what you're not. Yeah. So I started out thinking, yeah, I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, and I actively saying we don't want to say folk horror because mm. it's got these connotations. And I, I and I, um, I told a story before before about you know saying, 
we wanted to pitch it as a lost Cornish folk horror. Yeah. And then, um, I th- you know, some marketing people said, you don't want to be saying lost. We don't <laughs> want to be promoting it as lost. Yeah. Because that confuses things. So then it was um, Cornish folk horror. Yeah. And then I got worried about the horror audience. Thinking, <laughs> oh, we should, can it, have we decided it's a horror film? Surely it's up to the audience to decide whether it's a horror film. Mm. So I said, oh, we've got to distance ourselves from the word horror. So then we had Cornish folk. <laughs> which means nothing in relation to a film. <laughs> yeah. So let's lose folk. And so then it just comes back to being a Cornish film. So I love it. So what is this film? You say it's a Cornish film, which is, which is great because it is about that, you know, celebrating what we are rather than defining ourselves by what, by what we're not. Yeah. So I've gone full circle from thinking folk horror is this tiny little thing that's basically three films yeah. to actually, it, you know, it's sort of, <laughs> it's, it's easier to kind of list the films that aren't folk horror one way or another. I think so. I, that's one of the things I found fascinating about it. And we did a whole series of it on this podcast too. And, and, and even looking at that Unholy Trinity, and you're right, you know, they do have the connection that they're very English. But other than that, they're quite different in their content. You've got one that's historical, one that's supernatural. The Wicker Man is just kind of this cult kind of like horror film, yeah, right? Well, and exactly. Because uh, everybody thinks that, the, the, you know, think of the Wicker Man think it's supernatural. But there's nothing supernatural about no, it. No, no. Which find general is you exactly know, the it, whole point is that it isn't supernatural and, and actually it takes a much more i mean the horror there comes from the 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 sort of puritanical christians rather than pagans or whatever yeah, you yeah. know as well and yeah you know and, and but so but i think by that rationale there are so many things like you say it's easier to think, find things that aren't folk horror i mean even bait has that element of an outsider coming into this kind of community yeah. and not being you know, uh, kind of welcomed as yeah, yeah. much as they Upsetting could be. The you know, exactly, yeah, yeah. exactly. And if you start defining it like that, which is a really one of the ways you do yeah. define folk horror, then, then it's so many, yeah. you know, most BBC nine o'clock dramas. Right, exactly. Having an exactly. Broadchurch or something. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously, in America, you've got, you know, Deliverance and those types of movies yeah. as well. You know, yeah, yeah. It's, um, it's really fascinating stuff. And the horror itself comes from different elements as well. And I guess I just want to finish by asking you about the horror side of it. You know, did you have in mind, like you say, you know, thinking about horror audiences and what they want and what you wanted it to be? Did you have in mind kind of a, 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 any kind of. I don't know, s- scares, I suppose, for want of a better phrase, you know, when you were making this film and how you might unsettle or scare us. Yeah, I did have some because the, 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 in our home, in my home village, every yeah. Christmas, we do ghost stories. Mm. And it's usually on Boxing Day or the day after Boxing Day. I think we're going to do it on Christmas Eve this year due to some scheduling issues. <laughs> but we'll go to somebody's house, take it in turns, and we'll, we'll sit around the fire... Oh, I love this. In, his, in you know, sounds grand. It's not like the M.R. James sat around the fire, you know, <laughs> like crammed in, like around a small wood burner in yeah. the front room of a cottage. And we tell ghost stories. And, and you know, we're not, uh, there's not enough ghost stories that we've got to tell different ones each year. So quite often they're the same ones yeah. and embellished and changed for, yeah. changed for the times, you know, add a new character in that you've met that year or something. Yeah. And we do that every year and it's a real tradition. A few years ago, I told Ennis Main as a ghost story. Oh, amazing. On Day After Boxing Day. Mm-hmm. And it was great because I don't do test screenings or anything like that, really, when I've made the film. but And I don't do table reads or any of that kind of stuff. But this was a real test screening of, a, of an idea, you know, in its purest form, yeah. telling it around the fireside. And that was really interesting because I, I knew which bits were scary for people. And the bits that maybe I thought were scary people weren't that bothered about right yeah yeah and then i would you know i'd say a bit and you you'd see a reaction on people's faces of them being freaked out and think oh i'm going to keep going on this point then i'm going to really embellish this so there are bits in the film which came from me which are maybe personal experiences elements of you know I, I, i've never been a sort of woman living alone on an island before but there's bits in that story that are kind of things that have happened that i've woven in yeah things that i can't really explain and then, um, but there are other bits that are kind of just came from the sort of how to get from A to B in the story mm. that I then told verbally that I realized actually that's the bit that's that are kind of creeping people out. So yeah. it kind of became more, um, I, I try never to think about an audience yeah. when I'm making a film because it's a distraction. And also it's a sort of, um, yeah, it's a dangerous trap to fall in guessing what an audience might want. But that early writing process, telling that story, I could, you know, 
the audience were really telling me I had an audience at that point and they were really you know I have, was kind of having to perform to their sort of expectations and their mood yeah I love it I love it that's so interesting and I, I, I'm always interested to know as well you know as a filmmaker which part of it kind of is the most integral to creating that scare you know is it in the edit is it more writing it is it filming it you know like in terms of like creating kind of that kind of unsettling image or whatever it might be yeah I, I think <clears throat> it, I mean it's very rarely in the camera yeah um, it's a combination of everything. You yeah, know, it's the combination of the, of the of holding a picture on screen too long that it becomes unsettling, right? Yeah, or cutting away from it too quick that people haven't been able to rationalise what it is. Yeah, yeah. So it is more of a kind of edit. It's, it's an edit, and, it, and it's bringing the you know bringing the sound in. Yeah, is the thing that really is unnerving because you can have something that goes, oh, this that's just has this one specific meaning as an image. You know, mm. she's just looking for right. example you know it's a close up and she's looking suddenly you can change the meaning of that look by the sound you know in the same way that you can change the meaning of that look by what shot you cut to next and yeah. the Kushlov effect and yes. third meaning editing theory and all that kind of stuff but you can do that with sound as well and, and that's why I love doing all the sound myself afterwards because I can start from scratch you know I've got a blank canvas when it comes to the sound so there's yeah there's not I, and I think the sound is where you kind of unnerve people without you can create jump scares within the sound, and I think they the jump scares kind of embellish visual jumps, really. Yeah. But what you, the power of the sound is unnerving the audience in a way that they can't rationalise. Right. So visually, you can do something on the screen, say in a single shot, that is a bit unsettling. Yeah. But very quickly, the audience can, you know, if it's really harrowing, they can close their eyes or look away. If it's unsettling, they can. They can rationalise it. They can make sense of it. There's very few examples, I think, in in kind of horror films where you've got something within a frame that becomes increasingly scary rather than yeah. less scary without doing anything. I think the, the prime example is in Hereditary with the, <laughs> yeah, you know, the character in the on the roof on the roof. Yeah, where yeah. it just holds it, and you know, you, you if you've seen it in a cinema, yeah. you can hear the, each member of the audience individually realising what's happening. Yeah, and that's a work of art for you know to be able to do that I think it's much easier to do it with sound in the edit and you can do things in sound you can abstract certain things in the sound to make people feel uneasy without them knowing why they're f feeling uneasy and I think that like, David Lynch is the king of that you know it can just have say 60 tracks of naturalistic sound but one of those 60 tracks is playing backwards yeah and you don't hear it when you're <laughs> yep when you're watching it, but you're sat forward on your seat yeah. going, there's something odd about this. I don't know what, and because you can't rationalize it, it's even more yes. unsettling. It's my favorite type of scare, I think, more than a jump scare, that kind of, I get that from The Shining too, you know, yeah. speaking of flash forwards and uncanny images and sound design, and you're like, why am I so scared by this big yeah. empty corridor? But I am, yeah. you know. Well, it's atmosphere, isn't it? Yeah. And that's where, that's where cinema really comes to life and yeah. sort of fulfills its potential is when it creates the atmospheres that we cannot create with language yeah yeah and that's the dream state yeah you know not necessarily uh, you know the dream state can be quite horrific a lot of the times but it's always it's what it's why when you you know when you wake up you've had the most incredible dream and you want to tell somebody it mm -hmm. and you try and tell them yeah it never quite works oh it never gets anywhere near <laughs> it either sounds like you're making it up yeah. <laughs> or it sounds like the most boring thing <laughs> it's because dreams aren't plot driven yeah the dreams are atmosphere driven and, you, and that's why we had to invent cinema yeah. is so that we could communicate atmosphere because we can't do it with language we I still can't that. do it with language i love that um and finally then i'm going to finish by asking you what i love to ask all my guests um a hard question but what's your favorite horror film mark oh I think <laughs> being a listener of the podcast, I should have been prepared for this question, shouldn't I? <laughs> um, I, th I, think, I think my favourite horror film, certainly at the moment, is The Shout. I don't think I've seen The Shout. Oh, oh my God. I'm going to have to check this out. Skolomowski. Yeah. So he's got EO coming out. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. BFI are... Um, the Donkey one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, So he yeah. made a film in 1978 called The Shout. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, which I, yeah. I mean, ag again, I think, I think Kim Newman was the one who described it as, as the one, one of the sort of 1970s British yeah. 
I mean, Skolomowski's Polish, but it was it was shot in North Devon. This yeah, film. one of those um, 1970s horror films that isn't actually that's not quite a horror. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. I find it all the more horrific for uh-huh. it because it's so un- indefinable. And there's a couple of shots in that that a couple of sort of rostrum, rostrum freeze frame, right? Yeah, optical optical yeah. resizes in that you know that are just utterly terrifying. Oh, I love that. So I think oh. that, and, and, and if not that, then I always go back to Don't Look Now. Oh my God. And again, actually, there is a, there, and, it, and it's main gave me a Don't Look Now vibe at times as well. Maybe maybe it was the red coat, maybe it was the water. I don't know. But there yeah, well, was people a, have mentioned that and that, that was, I did walk into that accidentally. <laughs> yeah, of course. Because yeah. Mary's character was supposed to have um, a yellow coat. Right. And then, and the, the the boatman's coat was supposed to be red. And when she found the boatman's coat, it was supposed to be in the water, and it was supposed to be red just below the surface and looked like a pool of blood. Right. But I, at the last minute, I decided that Mary should have the red coat, mm-hmm. and the boatman should have the yellow coat because I didn't want Mary in a red coat with blue jeans, brown long brown hair because I thought people would just think I've nicked the look of Charlotte Gainsbourg out of Antichrist. Right. Yeah. 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 Which is quite a niche yeah. reference to be worried about and, <laughs> yeah. and then I thought no it'd be fine so she can't wear a yellow coat she'll have to wear a red coat and then on that well we, first day of the shoot I just heard somebody say to somebody else oh yeah the red coat that's a direct reference <laughs> don't look now and I was like oh cool oh shit <laughs> <laughs> I love it I love, well there's worse things to be comp- I mean that what yeah I mean what an incredible movie right don't yeah. look now and, 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 I swear, and don't look now is one of those films I think when I first saw it I, it didn't even I didn't even think of it as a horror film yeah. I thought of it like a thriller yeah yeah, yeah. But then when you watch it now, it's like, you know, it's got it's, the, the supernatural, it's got... Yes. It's a sort of slasher, it's got... It's got everything. And again, yeah. talk about the way in which the, the, the film itself, like the way in which time kind of folds in on itself in yeah. that movie and everything. It's yeah, so bizarre. Yeah, and that's the true horror. Yeah, it really yeah, is. Yeah, I mean, that's the the bit where he sees effectively his own yes. funeral. Yeah. I remember watching that. First time I saw it was on vhs tape while i was at university with a mate of mine who, who'd brought it round to our student house and i remember about three minutes after that scene sort of screaming because <laughs> the penny had dropped yeah yeah and just and there's there's a there's a there's a direct nod to that scene in at the beginning of bait right oh where, yeah, yeah, where yeah. martin is stood on the key yeah and he looks down at the fishing boat and the fishing boat moves backwards away from the key and he stood on he stood on the deck yeah and that was I couldn't resist it I love it I love it Mark it's been an absolute pleasure thank you so much for joining me thank you very much and that's it for this week's bonus episode a huge thank you to the brilliant Mark Jenkin for joining me such a treat to finally have him on the podcast and hopefully we've wet your appetites there for his new movie Ennis Main which is really worth a watch in the cinema particularly I would say if you get a chance so please try and check that movie out especially if you're a fan of creepy weird British folk horror I think it's going to be right up your street uh, let me know what you think of the film when you do get a chance to see it you can email me evolution of horror at gmail.com you can also find us on all the socials we're on facebook twitter instagram and letterboxd if this was your first episode of the podcast please do hit that subscribe button we've got a whole back catalogue of over 200 episodes featuring more interviews with brilliant people in the horror industry including mark gatis alice lowe mark kermode andy nyman and a whole bunch of other big names uh, and there'll be more bonus episodes with more special director interviews dropping very soon so keep your eyes peeled on your podcast feeds thank you so much for listening and join us again soon for another episode of the evolution of horror